From Broadway to television to the governor's mansion. Sounds like I'm talking about a politician or a presidential candidate or something. I could be talking about also my next guest, which I am, the man who stars in the hit TV series Benson. Would you welcome, please, a good friend, Robert Guillaume. <laughs> How is everything at the governor's mansion? Oh, fine, fine, John. We're having a much better time there than they are in the White House. <laughs> really? How so? Well, we have no, we have no Iran, we have no Miami, we have no inflation. But you have a lot of dumb people on the show. No, no, no. They're wonderful. No, those guys aren't dumb. Not dumb. But no. well, then why the do they need your help so much? Well, I mean, I just sort of step in. Benson's the kind of guy you can't keep, uh, keep down or something. Yeah. You've got great suggestions for how to run their lives and all. Would yeah. you ever want to go into politics? Could you do that for real? Run for, run for office? Not Benson, Robert Guillaume. No, I don't think so. I mean, the way, the way things go down, man, no, I'd be running from office in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you throw me out of there quickly. You, you and I have done several shows together, mm -hmm. uh, and I never s I see you coping with things, maybe it's a Broadway background that makes you just float to... Does anything upset you? Now, you know good and well that I got upset about that tuxedo we wore there at that time no, no. on that show. No, we no, didn't. those shoes were out to here, man, and they were, you know, they wanted us to dance. You know, they wanted us to do like this. And you couldn't dance in those shoes, and if you walked in them, they would bend. The, they wouldn't bend, and they'd break, break your instep. You, you just, you can't dance. Use those shoes. That's right, I can't dance. Well, no, admit I, it, it wasn't the no, shoes. No, I really can't. I mean, people, people say, you're a dancer. No, I can clown around and act a fool. But I cannot dance. I mean, if you bring in a choreographer and say, now we take two steps to the right and we take two steps to the left, I mean, I go, I'm just go, I, <laughs> Have you gotten used to this whole thing, being a star of a series? It, do you ride in limousines and do that whole... Oh, no, I can't stand limousines. I really can't. Why? I don't know. I like to do things myself. And uh, unless I'm going... Uh, sometimes it's convenient, but I just don't like to ride up to a place and have people say, who is that? Ooh, who is it? You know, and then they, then they see you and they say, uh, <laughs> So many times the studios think they're doing us a favor. Yeah, and they I can send think a of better car. ways to get rejected. <laughs> right, right. And when they pay for it, don't you ever... Th you never take it. I get well, sick. Well, well, sometimes the... I do. I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I don't make a big thing out of it. But, yeah. uh, but, uh, yeah. but I'm a country. I'm really like a, a country boy in the city with the cowboy boots. Yeah, Hello. right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. These aren't really cowboy boots. <laughs> Is it true? I've, I've wanted to ask you this, and I just found out about it this week. That the original Benson on soap, not of course on Benson, but the original Benson on soap was an oriental or was supposed to be an oriental well no i don't think he was supposed to be an oriental what what it, what it was is that when they couldn't find uh they see the, the bible the, the, that's the book of the show uh described him as an ancient retainer that meant that that meant uh, a retainer i and as i understand it is somebody who uh, uh has been with a particular group of people for a long time mm -hmm. sounds like an old dental plate <laughs> How does that make him Oriental? No, no. So he was supposed to be okay. black with gray hair and you know a, 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 a very slow gait and that sort of thing. And they they sim I don't know for one reason or another they couldn't find that type of actor. You mean a step and fetch it? No, 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 not a step and fetch it. They just wanted a guy who who looked old enough to to tell you off. In other words, it, it couldn't be a young guy who could tell you off, you know. It, yeah, but you do it not with wisdom of age, but with just intelligence. You, that's what's, you know. <laughs> yeah, you really do. <laughs> Benson on the show is, is very together. I mean, you've got it down. Is Robert Guillaume together as a person? No, no, no. No, never, never. I, uh, my life is, my life just, every time I straighten something out, I get it gets complicated in some other area. Uh, the one way one way I measure how I uh, how I've progressed, you know, since the time I used to stamp my feet in kindergarten, you know, when I didn't get what I wanted, is uh, is when I drive on the freeway, and I realize I haven't progressed at all because I'm I'm a I just curse 
I, I, I get so angry. I mean, people are meandering from one lane to the other. There are no signals. I mean, the first mistake, see, what you have to practice on the freeway is, is defensive driving. You know, and, and you, you can't make obvious mistakes. Mistake number one is to assume that there's anybody in the car ahead of you. <laughs> That the guy behind you has had his brake fixed in the last 10 years. Yeah, right, right, right. You can't assume that. No. Before you came to, to Soap, even, you've been everything, even before the Broadway days. Wait a minute, I resent that. No, but you, <laughs> not just in show business, you've been, how many different jobs have, have you tried after you got out of school? Well, after I got out of school, I... Uh... Other occupations. Well, I, I, was a, I was a candy cook, I was a shoeshine boy, I was an errand boy, I was a water boy, I was a, a, every kind of boy you could mention. <laughs> every kind of boy you could think of, and then I, uh, then I, uh, uh, then I, I drove a streetcar while I was going to school. In uh, San Francisco? No, in St. Louis. No, they had, they had streetcars. Well, that was, that was in the year one. I see. That was a long, long time ago. Yeah. And uh, then uh, I, was a, I was a clerk in the, for the, for the Army Finance Center. I did a lot of things before I came to show business, and I wasn't even thinking about show business. I was just looking around for something that I thought might... Uh... At that time, you weren't even Robert Guillaume. No, my name was Robert Lukashevsky. <laughs> no, he's serious. That's your real name? Are well, you putting me on? No, 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 I, yeah. I no. know it's not Guillaume, but what is your real name? My real name was... Uh... Helen Hayes. Yeah, right. <laughs> what? My real name was Williams. Robert Williams? Yeah. And, uh, see, with, with black people, you have to give them a name they can mess up, and they remember. <laughs> Where so, did uh, Guillaume come from? That's I why said. I got this name, because I wanted to have a name that they, that they would have trouble with. It's French. Yes, it's French. It's a Frenchification of Williams. It's simply Williams in French. Monsieur Guillaume. Oui, oui, monsieur. Voulez-vous ch ch chancer? Uh, ch ch comment, comment vous dites en français to sing? Huh? To sing. <laughs> when we come back. I would love to. Good. Yes, I would. Robert Guillaume is going to sing for us. We'll be right back. <laughs> at 5.30 on Channel 5. For those of you who didn't know Robert Guillaume could sing, you're in for a wonderful surprise. And for those of you who did, you know you're in for a wonderful surprise. Please welcome Robert Guillaume singing. <laughs> To your senses you've been out riding fences for so long now. oh you're a hard one i know you got your reasons these things that are pleasing you can hurt you somehow is always your best bet Now it seems to me that some fine things have been laid upon your table but you only want the ones you can't get Desperado Oh, you ain't getting no younger Your pain Prison is walking 
Robert Guillaume sings his hind end off. We'll be right back. of a TV newsroom Monday on evening. My next guest has been a hippie, a redneck, a convict, a surfer, and has received an Oscar nomination for his superb portrayal of Buddy Holly. How many of you saw that film? Wasn't that sad? <laughs> Jared Busey is a multifaceted performer, and he's starring now in his new film, Carney. Would you welcome, please, Gary Busey? <laughs> Come sit with me on this couch here. I was so impressed with your performance as Buddy Holly. I must tell you that you don't look anything like you did in the film now. There's obviously a reason for that. Yeah, the reason is it's good to change your... I like to change my body around, change my hair, and change my clothes. That way I don't have to do much. For, I can just walk through the... <laughs> You're talking about acting-wise? Yeah, acting-wise, yeah. yeah. Buddy Holly weighed about 155 pounds. I weigh about 185 now. My goodness, how did you go about gaining 30 pounds? Well, it's just easy. You just eat Mexican food and drink beer. <laughs> no, I got a, a nutritionist and a diet that I perform, and I swim 1,500 meters a day when I'm losing weight. I'm mm -hmm. going to go back down to 160 for uh, the next picture in September. To get ready for Buddy Holly, uh, must have been quite a... We've just seen uh, Coal Miner's Daughter with uh, Sissy yeah, Spacey. Uh, I thought she did a great job Me in that. Too. Did you? Me too. You betcha. In playing a performer, though, who has died, I mean, she's playing a living lady that she could go and study. <clears throat> yeah. How did you... How did you become Buddy Holly? Well, I grew up in Oklahoma, and I was in fifth grade when rock and roll started. I used to pantomime those Buddy Holly records back in my room until my mother would ask me to leave the house. <laughs> and so I played drums in college and high school. To, to, I've been playing rock and roll music for over 20 years. And I knew all the songs, and I sang all the songs in the key. He sang them in, so it was more or less built in. They just had to yeah. curl my hair, dye it, and give me glasses and lose It was the so real, the way you did it. You, you well, met us, you. You met us help, believe me. folks as well, where they have helped to you? Yeah, well, no, I didn't meet him until after the fact. That was pretty fearful. Uh, I went over to their house and picked up one of Buddy's guitars and played, Heart me, why do you skip when my baby touches me? Da, 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 da. And I was so nervous I couldn't finish the song. And uh, Mother Holly said, Honey, I think your G-string's just a little flat. <laughs> and just tune that up a little bit. And they weren't at all... They put you at ease. They put yeah. me at ease, yeah, like a mother and dad would. Yeah. And his, very his wife you met as well, didn't you? Yes. What, well. what was her reaction to the film? Well, she thought Buddy had gotten inside of me, and I didn't know what to think about that because I didn't have anything to look at or prepare for. I like the idea of not being quite prepared when you go out to do that work. That way it's uh, you're a little bit fresher, you know. You can change your verbs quicker, like you were talking about. When you're doing Shakespeare, you don't go out and mess with uh, the unrhymed iambic pentameter. You go out and say it as it is, but dealing yeah. with film and television, you... A little more scaredy. Yes, sir. It's, it's fresher, as you yeah. say. This, getting the Buddy Holly picture was a big breakthrough for you, right? I certainly I don't was. remember hearing of you before that. Well, George Selznick, uh, she was really instrumental in that. She cast a movie about Buddy Holly three years before that that got canceled, and she put me into this, and it was the first... Uh, focal responsibility I had, so it was like, uh, where do you go from here after all that happened? I got kind of frightened after that. You, you did a, a, a movie for television called The Law. Yes, sir. You were dynamite. That's where Thank I first you. saw him. He played a really... He played a junkie. Horrible character, but it, it was so full, it was so on, that, was that a, you were just rooted to him, and he had most of his scenes with the lead, who was Judd a m marvelous actor, and I found myself just watching this guy, oh, watching him. Uh, it, you, you have so much inside you, obviously, that you put into your roles. Tell us about Carney. Carney is a movie that's about a dinosaur, you know. The carnival's dying out. You folks have been to carnivals, perhaps, but they don't have many carnivals uh, uh, this side of the Rockies. But the freaks, because of prenatal care, are dying out. The monkey lady, the alligator man, the half man, half woman. And prenatal care has a kid normal when he hits the streets. And the theme parks, concrete theme parks, Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm are killing the canvas tent and the social laws and norms are taking away the gambling and the strip shows and the carnival is a 
about an American subculture. It's a film for the Smithsonian. We'll be able to pull this film out 100 years from now and see a true American subculture here. And the movie deals with two guys, relationship of these two guys in the carnival, and the environment is the carnival itself. And Jody Foster is a, and Robbie Robertson, my partner from the band, mm -hmm. you know, the guy, the last waltz, plays my partner. And Jody Foster is the girl that runs away and comes in between us. So we have that triangle affair going. Can you set up the film clip for us? Do you have a clip for the movie? Well, I think it's the one where uh, the girl first, she falls in love with the bozo, the guy on the midway, you know. Uh, That's you. Yeah. It's hard a voice like this. Hey, I'm looking for a ball player. I'm high and I'm dry. I ain't seen me a ball player all night. He locks himself in a cage and taunts these people to throw balls at him to knock him in the water, and he insults them. Hey, hey, what's that goofy-looking thing on top of your head? Anyway, this girl comes and gets infatuated with him, and uh, she moves in with him, and this is when the two boys, uh, one of the boys is jealous, and the other boy's saying, just give me some time. Let's see the film. Goodness. Uh, here's some hot coffee for you and substitute rapes. Did you do this for us? Oh. Well, how nice. Look at me, I'm dripping all over your floor. What do you think about this, Badge? I'm going to change. I'll be right back. I had some papers over here, an envelope. Did you see it? Oh, yeah, I threw it away. It's over there on the floor. Do me a favor. Don't uh, tidy up my stuff, okay? Well, it was dirty in here. It's all right. I like to write in the dust. What's that smell? What's that cooking smell? Well, he ought to have some proper food. I mean, he's going to catch cold in that tank. Frankie doesn't catch cold. Got some coffee. Hey. What is this, girlfriend time or something? What do you mean, girlfriend time? Is this your time? girlfriend out here? It's not my girlfriend. It's our girlfriend. It doesn't look like our girlfriend. To me, it looks like your girlfriend. Ah, uh, that's not it at all. Listen, she's just trying to be nice. Why don't you give me a chance to work this out? Frankie? Just give me a minute. Frankie? What? Come here, there's something going on out here. <sighs> well, it's probably your dinner's getting cold. I tell you, you are so... You are so straightforward and honest. I bet any director would consider you a dream to work with. Thank you for being on our well, show. Thank you. We have to break away for a few messages. We'll be right back. Gary Busey. Mm -hmm. Here she is, folks, Rita Moreno in her uh, rehearsal clothes. Would you believe that on TV you have to rehearse the way your dress will move under the lights? Thank goodness I don't have to rehearse my smile. Even when the camera comes in this close, I know my teeth will be their whitest. I use Pepsodent. Its low abrasion formula gets my teeth their whitest and keeps them that way. Look, if you want your teeth their whitest, you need Pepsodent too. It's a great performer. The Youth Drug, Tuesday at 10 on People Are Talking. It's a fabulous book. Back in the 1920s, there was a seven-year-old vaudeville star called Dainty June, who commanded a salary of, listen, $1,500 a week. At 23, she, I forgot to say, at, thir at 14, she was married. At 23, she became a Broadway star in Pal Joey, and has since performed in 23 stage plays and 43 films. In her second book, More Havoc, she dispels the myths about her mother, Rose, and her sister, Gypsy Rose Lee. Please welcome fabulous actress, a actress, June Havoc. Uh, you, of course, uh, this is a... Uh, let me start out this way. What should we take away from this, the second book? The first book was Early Havoc. Mm -hmm. This is More Havoc. What should we take away from this after reading it? Well, it's a trilogy. Uh, there's going to be another one. I'd like anyone who reads it or who reads Early Havoc, which, by the way, is in every Americana collection in the world, Ooh. because of it dealing with a, a time of our history, a time of our country, when we were on our knees, the Depression, and people mm -hmm. didn't think we'd get up and get out. And it's about a little band of people who did get up and get out. And more havoc carries on with that, except that it adds the dimension of my rather remarkable, remarkable female family. 
Yes. And they were eight. Without your father there, yes. Well, the men came and went, and they were sort of like disposables. <laughs> well, it's a really wonderful fun. view of men, yes, isn't yes, it? Yes. Well, it was, Use it us and throw us away. It worked for us. Paper mache. Is I this June? It really worked very well. Is the baby June in the book uh, really the baby June? Let's start with Gypsy, the, well, the, the film. Well, the baby June in that book, I didn't do anything until I was two. And then when I was two, I've been working ever since. And that baby June sort of is done with quickly because in early havoc we did her. Then we go on, and this book sort of picks up after the marathons, after the last ones. Right. And I go into my semi-adult life. In vaudeville, life. in vaudeville, in in most until you're about 14, you were still in vaudeville. Was well, that any way? Uh, vaudeville was no. dead, dying. The whole world was sinking into the orchestra pit, like that orchestra, you know, at the Roxy Theater. You yes. just go down, down, and out. <laughs> but that was a part of your early life. Was vaudeville anywhere for a kid to grow up? It was great for this kid to grow up. Listen, if you could be out center stage and hear all that laughter, the audience raised me. I think the fact that that's an affirmative life. This is an affirmative life. But wasn't it a gruff... It's because of that. Wasn't that a pretty gruff, rough and tumble? You've got stagehands backstage. Stagehands are the cream of the earth. Okay. Absolutely, they raised me. Huh. Don't sit on cement, stop chewing that gum. Uh, ladies, don't do that. Oh, no, the stagehands were my father's, and the acts on the bill, they were wonderful. How did it come that at the end of that sequence, you were married at 14? Well, it was a way out. Vaudeville was dead. My world had disappeared. I had to go out and find a life. And Mother didn't believe that Vaudeville was dead. She thought it was around the corner, it would revive itself. But, of course, I, at the age of 12, I kind of... There was this nice boy in the act, and I took out a contract on him. <laughs> I proposed. He said, sure, let's go out in the big world together. We did. And it was very hungry out there. But it was hungry for everybody at that time. The most memorable uh, phase about your mother, uh, to me, was when you described her death and, and how you went through that. Well, that's but, gothic, but I... I let's I, go back a bit. <laughs> was, I, she was uh, like a stage mother? But no. I know you don't mother, like that term. Well, no, because a stage mother conjures up something that mother wasn't. Mother was little, violet-eyed, delicate, never wore makeup, silk stockings, or high heels in her whole life, and she was lethal. What? Because mother, <laughs> well, that, that's when you are lethal. You know, if you're going to come on like a big noisy thing, everybody says, oh boy, and they get out of the way, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that isn't. But mother was convinced that whatever she wanted, she had a right to. Is she like the rose in Gypsy, oh, the no. show that you we see? That's, that's a fable. I hate to keep going back to that, but well, I... Well, all right, John, you I think we assume that Gypsy was yeah. your No, story, well, you shouldn't. If you look at the billing, Good. it's billed as a fable. And it is a fable. I've forgotten that, is it? Yeah. Yes, it's billed Gypsy as a fable. fable. It's a yeah. fable. Yeah. It's billed as a fable. Yeah. You talk and very little about your father in the book. Well, uh, there's very little to say. Poor man. <laughs> well, you know, those men didn't last very long. None of those men lasted very long. I held the record, but that wasn't until I was an adult. I had the same husband after a few bad tries all of my adult life. I was married for 25 years to Bill Spear. And that's mm. the whole family record all put into one. Because everybody had five, six, seven husbands, and I don't know how many lovers. We didn't even mention that. They just came and went. And people were very... You know, it's funny when you, you think about the freedom that women are enjoying, the partial freedom. I hope that it's going to be better for us. But there were an awful lot of women, John, who lived their own lives because that's the circle they were in. That's where the, there were no laws there in that particular place. I was never exposed to a school where someone would come up and say, well, this is the way you do it. I was never inside a real honest to Pete home. How were you trained? How did you go to school? I didn't go to school. School, four and five shows a day? Who had time for school? Tutors, backstage tutors. <laughs> I don't know. You, oh, John, thank it, you. Doesn't the law say that you have to go to school? Nowadays, well, they, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, nowadays, but they arrested me two or three times, took me off the stage, and it didn't take, you know, we kept going on and doing it. And I never did get a chance for what people call a formal education. How have you made it through all this? And Easily. <laughs> how? What, what is the inner strength that you have now? Where did you get that? Well, John, I've lived an affirmative life. Don't forget, I was surrounded with the cream of everybody. On the same bill were George Burns and Gracie Allen and Jack Benny, people who had dignity and people who had a purpose. My goals when I was a little kid are the same as my goals now. I want to be an actress. I want to belong to a small but exclusive quiet club. 
I want to, I'm restoring a village in Cannon Crossing in Connecticut, a 200 year old village. To me, that's the most exciting thing I could do. I have done and I am doing what I want to do. I'm in pictures. I've got a new picture coming out next week. I know you do. Uh, don't I, stop the yes, music. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a village people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could just see you singing with the village people. Well, I do it all the time. She wears a plumber's uniform. I, yes, I, yes, I, yes, you, yes. I, I am right there with those guys. Anyway, <laughs> life keeps going on and it's very affirmative. And in more havoc, the myths. The myths of all that tacky, tawdry life, that was only a very small part of it. Remember, for three, in the, in the old days, I used to sign a three-year blanket contract on the Keith Orpheum circuit. Three-year blanket contract. And you were there for three whole years in the best theaters in the world. Mm. And it was a wonderful life. Well, it's a fabulous story so far. This is part two of the trilogy. Tell us just a, briefly about part three. What will that, this stops in 54. I assume it'll go well, from 54 on. It, it really stops, that's a flash ahead for mother's death, but mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it'll pick up. It's when my first great big noisy stardom when I was in Mexican Hayride and the Michael Todd show and Hollywood and all of that. But then it isn't just me, it's women. This is a woman's book. But that's what I started out by asking. Why, what will, why would we want to read June Havoc's life? Well, it isn't. You see, I wouldn't want to read June Havoc's life. But this isn't June Havoc's life. Why, what is it? This is a story, an affirmative story, about a little band of rather extraordinary women who didn't have other people's rules and regulations and who didn't do the things other people did, but did their own things and how they made out in this world. And that's what makes it so fascinating. June Havoc, thank you for joining us. Thank I enjoyed you. talking to you. For inviting me. We'll be right back. <laughs>